السنة مثل سفينة نوح من ركبها نجا ومن تركها غرق الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد After praising Allah the Most High with love and veneration exclusively for him in a manner which befits his majesty and requesting him to send his salah and salam upon his final prophet and messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Qurish. We meet once again for our weekly meeting to study the classical text Al-Usool Al-Thalatha to the three fundamentals or the three foundations or the three principles illustrated by Sheikh Al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab Rahimahullah Ta'ala Currently we are discussing the second question which will be asked in the grave and that question is If it is said to you, who is your prophet? Man nabiyyuk, then you will say that Nabiyuna Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn Abdul Manaf. Say that our prophet is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, who was the son of Abdul Muttalib, who was the son of Hashim, who was the son of uh, Abdul Manaf. Going till the end. I discussed previously with you students the definition of a prophet and a messenger and I mentioned that a messenger is a person who is a man who is free who receives a revelation who is sent to a disbelieving nation with a new set of laws and is commanded to call to that which he has been entrusted with. This is a generic definition. It has its exceptions. With regards to a prophet, that it was said a prophet is a person who is a free man. When the word free is mentioned, it means that he is not a slave. When the word man is mentioned, it means that it cannot be a woman. This is known in the Arabic language as ihtirazat. Ihtirazat means when you say, when you define or determine one word, it it excludes the opposite. So when it says a free man, it means a slave cannot be a prophet or a message. When it says that it must be a man, it means that a woman cannot be a prophet or a message. And a prophet, and he receives a revelation. He is sent to a believing nation. He is considered to be a successor of a a messenger. And he is not sent generally to a disbelieving nation. And he is not given new set of laws. And he is commanded to uh, call to that which he has been entrusted with. So this was the definition of a prophet. And we discussed this. Also with regards to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's lineage, Nasab, it is very important that a student of knowledge memorizes the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's very important that you Memorize. Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad al-Wahhab rahimahullahu ta'ala, he just mentioned briefly some parts of the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every single student of knowledge must memorize the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No student is excused of not memorizing the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Sheikh al Islam mentioned this very briefly. Sheikh al Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, then mentioned the reasons of why the Prophet was chosen or selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be from amongst uh, the Prophets and the Messengers. As we know that Ibrahim alayhi salam is known as Abu al-Anbiya wa Rusul. What is he known as? He is known as the father of the Prophets and the Messengers. Because when Ibrahim alayhi salam supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him progeny that will continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his dua. When he made this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is from the progeny or from the lineage of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam had two sons, Ismail, whose mother was, anybody know the name of Ismail alayhi salam's mother? La? Yes. And Ishaq alayhi salam, his mother's name is? Sa. So from the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam, and Ismail alayhi salam settled in, in Mecca. We all know the story of what happened. And there some tribes passed by, some caravans passed by who were Arabs and who spoke the Arabic language. Ismail alayhi salam learned Arabic from them. So that shows that Ismail alayhi salam, um, his mother tongue was not the Arabic language. He learned the Arabic language and he married into uh, the Arabs. So this is what the people of, of, of lineage, they call, they say, Arab al that somebody um, who was not originally an Arab, meaning that he did not come from the lands of the Arabs. Because as we know that Ibrahim salam and Ismail salam came from a different region. Does anybody know what they, which side or which side of the world they came from? So they say that towards the direction of Iraq and that side is where Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, originally came from. And we find that uh, when they settled, Ismail alayhi salam settled in Mecca, but Ibrahim alayhi salam did not settle in Mecca. And he learned how to speak the Arabic language and he married within the Arabs. And then after generations after generations, he became known to be from amongst the Arabs. And um, he spoke the Arabic language and from his children were the Quraysh, the tribe of Quraysh. So Ismail alayhi salam, he had many children who then settled in the place uh, known as Mecca. Then they were divided into tribes and, and then from the tribes they were divided into clans. So from amongst the best amongst them was Quraysh, the tribe of Quraysh. And the best clan amongst the Quraysh was Banu Hash. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was from amongst the, the, the great tribe known as the Quraysh and from the best clan known as Banu Hash. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was chosen from, as the Shaykh mentions, and they were the best and the most elite of the Arabs. They were the, the best and the most elite amongst the Arabs and amongst the tribes and the clans. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was from amongst them, hence he was chosen. And the Prophet ﷺ was sent to Al-Ahmar wal Aswad, which we covered in the last lesson. We covered that the ulama, they have three positions with regards to what Al-Ahmar wal Aswad is referring to, and they all can be harmonized. And the Prophet ﷺ was sent to the whole of mankind. 
and jinn. That's the difference. The reason of why al-ahmar wal aswad has been mentioned specifically is to make that distinction that the, that the prophets and the messengers that came before the Prophet Sallallahu were only sent to a particular group of people or, a, or the nation that the Prophet Messenger belonged to. Whereas the Prophet Sallallahu was sent to the entire, to the whole of mankind, entire mankind, whether Al-Ahmar or Al-Aswad, whether Arab or non-Arab. Because usually the people are divided into two categories, Arabs and non-Arabs. And the Shaykh mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down upon him the book, the Quran, and the hikmah. The hikmah here refers to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as mentioned by al-Shafi'i and others. So this is with regards to a brief description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was given by Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad al-Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala. And this is the methodology that is adopted by the people of knowledge. That when the people of knowledge talk about or they write about personalities, the first thing that they will talk about is his lineage. They will talk about his lineage. So when you decide to write about somebody, the first thing that you research with regards to them is their lineage. If they are Arabs, then they will have their lineage preserved. With regards to us non-Arabs, and many of us, we don't have our lineage preserved. So for example, we may know till about 200, 300 years of our great, great grandfathers. And then after that, it is not known. And like I mentioned to you that the Misa or the distinction of the Muslim Ummah, which no other nation has been given, is their preservation of the lineage. That the Arabs, they have the lineage preserved documented, which they call, which you will see in a form of a family tree, which they call Shajar. So the Arabs, they have a continuous lineage going back all the way to their father, Ismail alayhi salam. So that's why it's very important that a person, when he memorizes the lineage of the Prophet he memorizes all the way going back to Ismail alayhi salam. So the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Shaykh al-Islam, after giving a brief description of giving the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ, second, explaining why the Prophet ﷺ was chosen from the Quraysh, the best and the elite, and the best clan amongst the Quraysh, Banu Hashim. And from Banu Hashim, Banu Abdul Muttalib. Banu Abdul Muttalib, the children of Abdul Muttalib, as Abdullah is the son of Abdul Muttalib, who was the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here, Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad al-Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions the, the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If somebody was to ever ask you to give a very brief description of the risala or the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this would be the best way to describe it. So he says, Shaykh al-Islam, he says, so he called the people to making ibadah sincerely and purely for Allah and abandoning what they used to worship besides Allah. So this is the mission and the da'wah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is, which, which consists of two pillars. The pillar of affirmation, which is to make ibadah sincere, mukhlisan, for Allah alone. And the pillar of negation, which is to abandon what they worship, what the people used to worship besides Allah. And then the Shaykh gave examples. What follows after that is the examples that the people fell into when they committed shirk. Idols, stones, trees, prophets and the righteous people, angels, and other than that. So if somebody was to ask you that, can you define for me the da'wah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If you wanted to define the da'wah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in simple words, in a sentence, one or two sentences, 
then this would be a comprehensive statement or sentence that you can say to the people. That the Prophet's da'wah was to call people to worship Allah sincerely. And look at the words. He didn't just say worship. What did he say? He said, Ibadah sincerely. Fada'annas says, Fada'annas ila ikhlas al ibadati lillah. So not only to worship Allah, but to sincerely worship Allah. Why? Because the kuffar of Makkah worshipped Allah. Yes or no? They worshipped Allah when they embarked upon the ships. They worshipped Allah alone. When they came back to shore, then they went back to their ship. So the da'wah of Muhammad Rasulullah was not just to tell the people to worship Allah. It was to tell the people to worship Allah alone sincerely in all situations. In all situations. Hence the word ikhlas al-ibadati lillah has been mentioned. فَدَعَ النَّاسَ إِلَىٰ إِخْلَاسِ الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ So if you were to memorize this statement, it would be beautiful. فَدَعَ النَّاسَ إِلَىٰ إِخْلَاسِ الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ And somebody was to ask you that why did you include the word ikhlas? One, there are many people who worship Allah, but they make shit with it. Secondly, when you make ibadah sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it shows that you are sincere to Him at all times and in all circumstances and in all conditions, whether you are happy or whether you are sad. And then He said, وَتَرْكِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ and to abandon and abandoning what they used to worship besides Allah. So this, this statement this statement clarifies what the Sheikh meant when he said Fada'annasa ila ila ikhlasil ibad. This statement ikhlasil ibadah this 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 is a clarification of it, a further elaboration of it, that abandoning what the kuffar of Makkah used to worship besides Allah. And we know that they used to worship besides Allah in times of happiness, not in times of distress. Then the Shaykh, rahimullah, he gave the examples and he said, so he called the people to abandon shit. And he fought them so that they may abandon it. So here the Shaykh Rahimullah, he mentioned, he said, he called the people to abandon shit. The da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to call the people to abandon shit. That shows that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to the people, they were misguided. The people were upon misguidance. So to take them out of this misguidance, which was shirk, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called them to abandoning the ship. That shows that misguidance, if people are upon misguidance, then you have to make that misguidance clear to the people. You have to be public about it. About the misguidance that the people are upon. For example, in this instance, the ship, which is the greatest form of misguidance. وَقَاتَلَهُمْ And this is very important. This statement here, as it can be taken out of context, and he fought them. Meaning that he fought them. Which means that qital is a medium that is utilized if there is a need for it. So when there was a need for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to eradicate and eliminate the shirk with utilizing the medium of doing jihad or fighting against them, that was adopted. So it was a means to an objective and not the objective itself. It was a wasila to the ghaya and not the ghaya itself. Is that clear? And who permitted him to fight? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the objective of fighting against them is that they abandon, that they become sincere. So that they abandon it, they abandon the shirk and they single out Allah in ibad, alone without any part. So the first we find that the first step that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the first command of Allah was to call them to the haqq, to warn them against shirk and hoping that they will abandon their shirk. If they became violent, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to defend the truth by fighting against them as a medium, if there was a need for it. Not every single time was this medium adopted. As we know, at many times, this medium was also abandoned. In the time of Hudaybiyah, the Muslims were ready to fight. But at that time, the Prophet wasallam, with the command of Allah, did not adopt the medium of fighting. But a peace treaty was made. A peace treaty was made. This is a refutation of those who say that the jihad is always the objective. Or jihad is the only way. Jihad is part of the deen. And jihad has its conditions. And jihad will be adopted as a medium when it is prescribed and when it is done in its proper manner. And at times it will be utilized and at times it will not be utilized. And this all goes back to the affair of the Muslim leader who decides with regards to the situation of the Muslims. Even to the extent that we find even in history or throughout different history, we find different Muslim rulers at times did not fight against their enemies, but preferred to have a treaty with them because that was more beneficial for the Muslims. Now, then the Shaykh, rahimahullah, he mentioned these ayat. We'll take one ayah at a time and we'll take a few benefits. The first ayah he mentioned is قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَدْعُوا رَبِّي وَلَا أُشْرِكُ بِهِ أَحْدًا So this is the style of Shaykh al-Islam. Shaykh al-Islam, he brought a brief introduction of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he explained to us why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was chosen amongst his people. Then he told us who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was sent to. Then he informed us what was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Then he informed us of the da'wah of Muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Then he informed us of the different misguidance of the people. Then he informed us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to the length of calling people to the truth and telling them to abandon the shirk and misguidance, even if it meant that he had to fight them, he fought against them. Because the objective was to eliminate shirk from the face of this land. And then after that, he brings all the proofs. He brings the proofs, he says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَدْعُوا رَبِّي وَلَا أُشْرِكُ بِهِ أَحَدًا Which is in Surah Al-Jinn. But say, O oh Muhammad, I invoke only my Rabb, and I associate none as partners along with him. Two things have been mentioned in this ayah. First is dua, and then shirk. Calling upon or invoking. So this shows from this ayah, implicitly we can make the inference that calling upon Allah is an act of ibadah. And to call upon other than Allah is an act of shirk. That's why in conjunction, after it is mentioned that ad'u rabbi, it is mentioned wala ushiriku bihi ahda. I don't associate my partners with anybody, meaning I don't associate any partners with my ibadah, with Allah, meaning don't call upon anyone other than Allah. Is there, did everybody understand this? So we see how Ad-du'a and Ash-shirk have been mentioned hand in hand here. First, du'a has been mentioned and it has been restricted to who? 
to Allah. Ad'u Rabbi. Rabbi, my Rabb, is restricting that dua that when I call upon and when I invoke, I only call upon Allah. I don't call upon anybody other than Allah. And then for further clarification, is mentioned that wala ushriku bihi ahd. So if you look at the siyaq or the kalam which has been mentioned, we always take back what has been mentioned to its aqrab of what has just been mentioned, aforementioned before it. So wala ushrik here is in relation to what? Ad. So two verbs have been mentioned. Ad'u and wala ushriku. Ad'u affirming only for Allah, wala ushriku negating for anybody other than Allah. So this shows that it is referring to ad dua. The second ayah which the Shaykh mentioned is Qulillahu a'budu mukhlisan lahu dini. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to announce to the people, to tell the people. Qul. Whenever the word Qul is being mentioned, this is an imperative command from Allah for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to publicize what is going to be mentioned here. So Allah says, Qul. Qulil laha a'budu mukhlisan lahu deen. And say, O Muhammad, Allah alone, I worship. When the maf'ul or the past participle is mentioned before the fa'il, which is the active participle, this shows, this indicates restriction. Always remember this. If the past participle is mentioned before the active participle, this is what we call has restriction. So for example, You alone, you alone do we worship. In the very same way here, say Allah a'budu. Allah, that I only worship Allah. Not I worship Allah. If you, if, so there is a difference between a'budullah and Allah a'budu. Allah a'budu means that only and only do I worship Allah. A'budullah means I worship Allah. See the difference. The restriction in the Arabic language. When you say Allah a'budu, this is to emphasize and restrict. That there is no room for any leeway or doubt or discussion. Allah a'budu. That I only and only worship Allah. So Allah says here to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that say Allah A'budu. And not do we, I do not only look at the words. First there is restriction. What is there? Hasr, restriction. Because the past participle has been mentioned before the, the doer, the active participle. Secondly, the word mukhlisan has also been mentioned. So that even further emphasizes. First he said, Allah alone do I worship. And then after that it's mentioned, mukhlisan, sincerely. In what state? Mukhlisan here is hal, meaning sincerely in all conditions. Lahu deen. Lahu? Dini. Qulillaha a'budu mukhlisan lahu dini. So, lahu dini here means deen. Does, can anybody tell me in this context what would the word deen be referring to? Let's see if anybody understands. Oh. Huh? How many meanings of deen did we cover? Seven, huh? Which one? would be applicable here. So, Qulillah, that Allah alone do I worship sincerely, lahu deen. So this is the second ayah with Shaykh al-Islam. So this ayah in itself emphasizes and restricts all forms of ibadah only for Allah. 
if you can't restrict Allah for ibadah and cannot see the the grammatical construction of this ayah. In fact, we could spend a whole lesson going through the grammatical details of this ayah to show that grammatically, after understanding the grammatical perspective of this ayah, there would be no need to bring any further information to establish that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be called upon, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be worshipped alone, and there is no room for anybody else. The third ayah the Shaykh mentioned is, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَعْبُدَ اللَّهِ وَلَا أُشْرِكَ بِهِ إِلَيْهِ أَدْعُوْ وَإِلَيْهِ مَا Say, O oh Muhammad, I, com- I am commanded only to worship Allah alone and not to join partners with Him. To Him alone I call and to Him is my return. In this ayah, first of all, we have the command of Allah telling the Prophet ﷺ to publicize and to inform the people. Call. Second, Explicitly, Allah has, uh, has told the Prophet ﷺ to tell the people that he has been commanded. Omit. This is the first one. The second is an a'bud Allah. Starting with the Prophet ﷺ himself, that I worship Allah. And the second is, wala ushrika bih, that I don't associate partners with him. And third is, ilayhi adu wa ilayhi ma'a. That to him alone I call and to him is my return. So now when we look at this ayah briefly, we find that ibadah has been mentioned first and its opposite has been mentioned immediately after it. So ibadah clearly in this ayah means at tawheed and wala ushrika bih. So Al-Ibadah and At-Tawheed are synonymous. To worship Allah alone means At-Tawheed. And not to worship Allah alone means a shirk So first the Prophet ﷺ mentioned himself. Allah commanded him to mention himself and to proclaim to the people that I worship Allah and I do not associate partners with him. The restriction did not come here. Remember in the ayah before, it was mentioned, Allah a'budu. Allah a'budu. Now Ismail, it was mentioned, Allah a'budu. So the restriction came first. In this ayah, there was no restriction. It was just mentioned, a'budullah. But immediately after it was mentioned, a'budullah, the restriction came, we're not doing shit. So here the restriction came, immediately, after mentioning Allah. So that's why you will find that nowhere in the Quran that is mentioned that we worship Allah except that shirk has been negated with Allah or any form of associating partners with Allah is not clarified. Because making ibadah of Allah, somebody can make ibadah of Allah and make shirk with Allah, like the kuffar of Makkah. So here when Allah said, A'budullah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say that, say A'budullah, he said, wala ushirka so either the restriction comes first or the restriction follows. And here the restriction was followed. That there is no, that I don't do shirk with Allah. I worship Allah in the state that I, or in the condition that I don't do shirk with Then, ilayhi ad'u. Again, this is a refutation of those who call upon other than Allah. Ilayhi ad'u. There is a difference between when you say adu ilay and ilayhi adu. Just like just like a'budullah and Allah a'bud. So here clearly this is a refutation from everybody that who calls upon other than Allah. This is a refutation upon them that the Prophet said that I only call upon Allah. Ilayhi adu. Ilayhi adu. That I only call upon Allah. And to Him is my return. Meaning that surely, without any doubt, I will return back to Him. 
a refutation of those who say, of the Kufar of Makkah who would say that we're going to become dust. There's no return. This is a refutation on them. What is this? Wa ilayhi ma'ab is a refutation of the Kufar of Makkah who did not believe in returning back to Allah. So these two restrictions, ilayhi adu'u, wherever it was mentioned, that I only call upon my Rabb, which we mentioned, and I see adu'u Rabbi wa la ushrika bi. The restriction here comes after. Here the restriction comes first, ilayhi adu'u, that only, I only call upon Allah. I only call upon Allah and I will only return back to Allah. But my return is surely back to Allah alone. No, but I'm not going to return back to anybody else. Tayyip, is this ayah clear? So this is a great refutation of those who call upon other than Allah. Say to them, tell me the benefit of Allah mentioning or telling the Prophet ﷺ to mention that he only calls upon Allah. Ilayhi ad'u. Why didn't Allah say ad'u ilayhi? Why did he? Why didn't Allah tell the Prophet ﷺ to say ilayhi ad'u? Again, hasr, which is known as restriction. To show that, iya kan abudu. We don't say that, oh Allah, we worship. Like the Christians, they say, oh Lord, we worship. The difference between the Christians and the Muslims is that the Christians also say that we worship the Lord. But the Muslims say that we worship only Allah, only Allah, meaning <coughs> that ibadah can be divided. It can be for Allah and for other than Allah. The kuffar of Makkah made ibadah of Allah and other than Allah. To refute this and to make it clear that this is misguidance, it was said that we only worship. We only worship. Then the next ayah that was mentioned is قُلْ أَفَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ تَأْمُرُونِّي أَعْبُدُ أَيُّهَا الْجَاهِلُونَ وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَبْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَا تَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ بَلِ اللَّهَ فَاعْبُدْ وَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِ So again, the, the mushriks of Makkah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet to go and dialogue with them and give them this message. And he said to them, the mushriks of Makkah, that do you order me to worship other than Allah? Ayyuhal jahilu. O you ignorant ones. Ayyuhal jahilu. So, the ones who worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the benefit that we can take is that they can be called jahilu. There is no um, defaming when you call somebody who worships other than Allah a jahil, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them jahilu. As we know that the kuffar, as, as it has been mentioned by some of the scholars, they had this theory and they said to the Prophet, why don't we do this? One year we worship Allah. One year you worship our idols. You know, we do this 50-50 business. You know, one year we make you happy, one year you make us happy. They a compromise. Barakallah like said, you know, we let's come to a mutual agreement. 50-50 type of a thing. Make us happy, we make you happy. So Allah SWT rebukes the kuffar of Makkah clearly by saying to the Prophet that tell them that when you when I speak to you about the truth when I call you to Tawheed when I, when I rebuke and refute your shirk are you telling me that I should worship other than Allah? And then the refutation comes. First the Prophet brings their argument and brings their claim by Allah. And then Allah refutes the argument by saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they say, وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tell them that indeed, wahi has come to you. What has come to you? Wahi. وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ And those who came before you. 
And what was this wahid? That every single prophet and messenger who received wahid before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was told. He was told before everybody else was told. La in ashrakt. If you join others in worship with Allah, then surely all your deeds will be in vain. So this is Dalil. What is this? This is clear-cut Dalil which we have taken before in Al-Qawaid Arba, I believe so. That shirk cancels out and destroys all your good deeds. So the fasting and the hajj and the zakat and the sadaqat are of no benefit. A complete waste of time and energy. If you associate partners with Allah, immediately a shirk al-akbar, all your deeds are destroyed and will be in vain. And what will be the result of this person? who does good deeds, but his good deeds are rejected and destroyed and are of no benefit to him, then you will be from amongst the losers. Losers in the dunya and losers in the akhir. And then the Prophet ﷺ was commanded by Allah to say to the kuffar of Makkah, Balillaha fa'bud. Again, what do we have here? Who is mentioned here? What is mentioned first? Allah. Allah. What does this mean? Only to Allah. Only to Allah. Restriction. Again, look how many times in how many ayat Allah mentions the restriction. But say to them, Allah hafa'bud. Why did Allah bring the restriction here? Because the kuffar of Makkah used to worship Allah. Didn't they? Didn't they worship Allah? And didn't they worship the idols? So to re- refute that, Allah mentions, no, say to them, only Allah. Say to them, this is not acceptable. This will not be accepted. That you worship Allah when you feel like it. And you abandon Allah when you feel like it. No, but say to them, Allah fa'bud. Wa kum And be from the grateful ones. Grateful ones, why? Because the greatest bounty a person can be given is the bounty of guidance. What is the greatest bounty a person can be given? And guidance is built upon a tawheed and abandoning of shirk. If we have been commanded by Allah to be grateful for every little bounty that we have been given, then what about the greatest bounty that we have given? That's why don't think that you have to only be grateful if Allah gives you money or gives you wealth or gives you help. But in fact, this is a command from Allah that be grateful to Allah because of Tawheed, because of the Tawheed that Allah has given you. So how many of us are thankful to Allah because of the Tawheed Allah has given us? And the shirk that is out there, Allah has protected us. Can there be anything greater than that? Can there be a greater bounty than the bounty of Tawheed and the protection of shirk? Allah says, وَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ وَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ Be grateful to Allah. So this ayah is an amazing ayah. We could sit and if we were to look at the tafasir and bring the statements of the sahaba and what the Prophet ﷺ said, we could spend hours and hours analyzing this ayah. We can spend hours and hours analyzing this ayah of how this ayah has been constructed, the benefits of this ayah, what this ayah implies, what is explicit, what is implicit, why this has been mentioned. Notice one thing, that whenever there is a dialogue between the kuffar and Allah, there is always a restriction. Yes? The restriction. Either the restriction is made at the beginning or it, is, or it follows. But there is a restriction. So that is the benefit of today. Somebody asked that whenever ibadah is mentioned, it is mentioned mukhlisan or with a restriction. Wala or the past 
or the ismu maf'ul or the restriction is mentioned, the hasal is mentioned before it. We move on to the, the next thing the Sheikh mentioned. The Sheikh says, He said, وَمِنْ أُسُولِ الْإِيمَانِ الْمُنْجِ مِنَ الْكُفْرِ الإيمان بالبعث والنشر والجزاء والحساب والجنة والنار حق. And from the usul foundations of iman which saves from kufr, from disbelief. From the fundamental foundations of iman which saves you from kufr, disbelief are the following things. Belief in the resurrection. Al-Imanu Bil-Ba'atha. Wal-Nashr. Retribution and recognition. And Wal-Nashr is retribution and Wal-Jaza is recognition. And Jannah is paradise and the hell and Nar is hellfire. These are all real. These are haq. Why did the Sheikh mention this? Here the Sheikh wants to point out that these are the fundamental beliefs which the kuffar of Makkah rejected. They did not believe in any of these beliefs. And Sheikh al-Islam said that these are the beliefs that can only enter you into Jannah, that can protect you from kuffar. So the kuffar of Makkah did not believe in usul al-iman. And he mentioned al-iman bil ba'th to believe in resurrection, retribution, which is a national, al-jaza, which is three, reckoning, jannah and jahannam, five things. How many things did Sheikh al-Islam mention? Five things. All these five things, the kuffar of Makkah disbelieved in and they say that Al-Iman generally refers to the, to the actions or the beliefs of the heart. So for example, none of us have seen, we cannot see, we have not seen resurrection, but we believe in it. We have not seen retribution, but we believe in it. We haven't had the reckoning that we don't, which is going to happen. Al-Jannah and Nar, we haven't seen it, but it's going to happen. Meaning those things which are not, there is no visibility, but must be believed. The kuffar of Makkah, they rejected them due to many reasons. So Shaykh al-Islam says that if you don't believe in these, then you will go to the hellfire for eternity. So this is a refutation of the kuffar who believed in Allah, but rejected these beliefs. Whereas Allah, from all the prophets, that was sent and the messengers from Nuh salam informed the people of all these beliefs. There wasn't a nation, a group of people or a prophet or a messenger and the nation that did not believe these five things. Every single prophet and messenger and their nations, they believed in these five things. Al-Ba'th, Wal-Nash, wal jaza and wal hisab wal jannah wal nar is that clear and then he brings the refutation remember i said to you that if you believe that the kuffar of makkah believed in some aspects of rububiyyah they didn't believe in rububiyyah totally one of the beliefs of rububiyyah is what to believe that allah is unique in his actions yes Allah is unique in his actions. And Allah is all-powerful. Yes? yes? Now, if Allah is all-powerful, when you die, and you believe that he's powerful, he can resurrect you, bring you back to life again. Yes? But the kuffar of Makkah rejected this. So they rejected that Allah is all-powerful. Because they said that, no, once we become dust, Allah cannot gather us again and bring us life again. Once we die and we become dust, we become dust. There's nothing. So this shows that their belief in Urububiyyah 
was not total, was not perfect, was not correct. Because if you say that Allah is unique in his actions, that Allah has the power to do anything. So if he created you from a drop, what happens when your bones can create you again? That's much easier. To create you from nothing and from a drop is easier than resurrecting you when you become bones. Logically. Yes or no? But they deny that. Because they deny that the person will be resurrected, then they will deny that there is any reckoning. Then they will deny that there is a Jannah. Then they will deny that there is a Nab because there is no accountability. Only if there is accountability, Al-Hisab, can you then go to Jannah or Jahannam. Only if you're going to be held accountable, there's Nash. So you see how the order was mentioned. First, Al-Ba'th was mentioned. First, when you, if, if in order, when there is resurrection, then there is retribution. When there is retribution, there is reckoning and accountability. And then after accountability comes Jannah or Nah. And all of these are And they denied all this. They denied. The Kuffar of Makkah, they denied all of this. And this is a refutation from him. And he brought the ayah. He said, Minha khalaqnaakum wa fiha nu'idukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhum. Notice one thing. The methodology of Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, in refuting those who deny the afterlife. Yes, life after death. What methodology did he adopt? He adopted the methodology of utilizing the ayah of the Quran to refute them. And who is the one who revealed this ayah and refuted the kuffar of Makkah? Who? Huh? Prophet. And who and where did the Prophet ﷺ get this from? Allah. So this shows that if you want to give da'wah and you want to engage in refuting the kuffar, whose argument are you going to use? The philosophers? The ones who dwell into rhetoric? Or you're going to use the manhaj of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in da'wah? This clearly shows you that the manhaj of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab is the manhaj of the Quran. Who are we talking to here? Are we talking to Muslims? Who are we talking to? The kuffar. And what are we talking to the kuffar about? Now, what's the issue that's being discussed here, which they reject? Resurrection, the afterlife, al baath So, how did Allah subhanahu wa taala refute them? Allah said, "Minha khalaqnaakum." There of the earth we created you. You were made from this dust. And, in, and into it we shall return. You'll go back to this earth. And from it we shall bring you out once again. Three stages. You are created from it. You will return back to it. And you will be resurrected from it. All going back to the dust, the earth. You're created from this earth. We'll send you back to this earth. We'll take you back from this earth. How difficult is that to understand? Well, is that clear? So this is a refutation of the kuffar of Makkah who rejected al-ba'th, wal-nash, wal-jaza, wal-hisa, wal-jannah, wal-nar, and Shaykh al-Islam said, Haqqun. This is all the truth. All of these are going to happen. All going to happen. A refutation of, of some of the deviated sects as well. Then the Shaykh rahimahullah mentioned the next ayah where he said, وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعَجَبُ قَوْلُهُمْ أَإِذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَإِنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أولئك الذين كفروا بربهم وأولئك الأغلال في عناقه وأولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالد. I mentioned to you that the 
evidence that can be found in the Quran can be divided into two categories. Al-Adillatul Naqliya, which is textual proof directly from Allah, which cannot be questioned. So for example, when Allah says that there is life after death, we accept this. This is proof for us as textual proof. Then we have Al-Adillatul Aqliya, rational proofs or rational evidence. This type of evidence is when Allah brings uh, to refute the kuffar who try to reason with rational argumentation. Yes? So for example, they say to the Prophet How are we going to be raised again when we become dust? Impossible. Yes? So now if the Prophet says to them, Allah says that you will be raised. Allah says that this will happen. They will say, well, we don't believe in this Allah of yours. We don't believe in this part of what your Allah says here. Yes? So what does Allah do? Allah refutes them. Within the Quran, there is rational arguments within the Quran. <coughs> and this is the ayah that he reads. Shaykh al-Islam, what is it? it says? And if you, O oh Muhammad, wonder at, at these polytheists who deny your message. So Prophet comes with them, tells them about Tawheed, tells them about Al-Ba'th, tells them about the hereafter. And they're like, nah, we can't believe in this. This is all, you know, bogus for us. And have taken besides Allah others for worship who can neither harm nor benefit. So these polytheists who deny the message of message of uh, the disciple of Rasulullah and they have abandoned Tawheed and they worship others besides Allah, then wondrous is their saying. Look at them, Allah is bringing the argument. They're, Allah is now bringing in the Quran the rational argument. When we are dust, shall we indeed then be raised in a new creation? Look at that. They say to the Muslims, so are you saying that when we become dust, Allah is going to create us again? They are those who disbelieve in their Rabb. They are those who will have iron chains tying their hands to their necks. They will be dwellers of the fire to abide there. So this ayah, it brings the argument that they present. They say, أَإِذَا كُنَّ تُرَابًا أَإِنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ In other ayats of the Qur'an, Allah destroys this argument. Here he just mentions the argument and says that due to them bringing this petty argument, the end will be that they will be tied up, chains, tying their hands to their necks, and they will be in the hellfire forever. Because why? Because they deny the resurrection. So this ayah, this part of the ayah, that Ula'ika ashabun nari hum fiha khalidun is evidence to show that anybody who rejects resurrection, accountability, reckoning, and jannah, and nar, is gonna is from the disbelievers and will be in the hellfire forever. Even if he says that he believes in Allah. So the Sheikh says, and in this ayah is a proof that whoever rejects the resurrection has disbelieved with a kufr that makes abiding eternally in the hellfire obligatory. Now look at this inference. If a person can enter the hellfire for eternity because he disbelieved in al-ba'th. What about the one who makes shirk with Allah? Will he not be entered into the hellfire for eternity? Here we have kufr, there we have shirk. May Allah grant us protection from kufr and the actions of kufr. That's what the shirk says. So this is another inference to show what he said. Then the Shaykh, he says, so these ayat contain a clarification of what he sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet all these ayat that the Shaykh mentioned, 
dua, ibadah, shirk, resurrection, all these things the Prophet was saying. From making worship sincerely for Allah to worship Allah, mukhlis. And the prohibition of worshipping anything besides Allah. And restricting worshipping to his worship. This is what the Prophet was sent. Prophet was sent that we, so that as uh, the Sheikh mentions here, he says, فَضَمَّتْ هَذِهِ الْآيَاتُ بَيَانَ مَا بُعِثَ بِهِ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مِنْ إِخْلَاسِ الْإِبَادَةِ The Prophet ﷺ from making worship ibadah sincerely for Allah. And the prohibition of worshipping anything besides Allah. وَالنَّحْيُ and ibadati غَيْرِ اللَّهِ And he didn't stop here. Look at this. Two things the Shaykh mentioned. First, making ibadah mukhlisan, sincerely for Allah. Secondly, he mentioned the prohibition of making ibadah for anyone other than Allah. And then he mentioned the, the most important point here. He said, وَقَصْرِ الْإِبَادَةِ عَلَى الْإِبَادَةِ Restricting ibadah, restricting ibadah to his ibadah. So this is a thing which you always need to mention. When you mention ikhlasul ibadati lillah. When you mention wal nahyu an shirki lillah. An ibadati ghayr. When you mention ikhlasul ibadati lillah. Wal nahyu an ibadati ghayr lillah. Wa qasr al ibadati ala al ibadati lillah. So these are the three things whenever you talk about tawheed. This is comprehensiveness in its totality. But some mention tawheed. So mention shirk, which is fine. But when you say, وَإِخْلَاسُ الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ Ibadah sincerely for Allah. وَالنَّحْيُ الْإِبَادَةِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ The prohibition of making ibadah for anyone other than Allah. وَقَصْرِ الْإِبَادَةِ عَلَى الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ To restrict ibadah for Allah Allah, absolutely. These are the three things that the Sheikh mentioned. And this he said, وَهَذَا دِينُهُ أَلَّذِي دَعَ النَّاسِ These are the three things that the Prophet, um, that Muhammad, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam quote. إِخْلَاسُ الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ إِخْلَاسُ الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ وَالنَّهْيُ أَنْ إِبَادَةِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ وَقَصْرِ الْإِبَادَةِ عَلَى الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ This last point emphasizes and clarifies what these two joint statements result, the result of the two joint statements. إِخْلَاسُ الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ وَالنَّحْيُ عَلَى الْإِبَادَةِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ This will result وَقَصْرِ الْإِبَادَةِ عَلَى الْإِبَادَةِ لِلَّهِ This is what it will result. The two statements are Ibrahim. What will the result be? Qasr al-ibadati ala al-ibadati lillah. When you implement this. So whenever you talk about Tawheed and Shirk, restrict it, lock it. When you say, Ikhlas al-ibadati lillah, wa nahyu an-ibadati ghayrin, say, wa qasr al-ibadati ala al-ibadati. This now leaves no room for any discussion. And Shaykh al-Islam, he says that these are the three components of the da'wah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa وَهَذَا دِينُهُ And this is the deen. When he said, مَا دِينُك When he said to you, مَا دِينُك وَهَذَا دِينُهُ أَلَّذِي دَعَ النَّاسَ إِلَيْهِ وَجَاهَدَهُمْ عَلَيْهِ And when he fought them, this is what he fought them before. For. He fought them for إخلاص الإبادة لله والنهي عن إبادة غير الله وَقَصْرِ الْإِبَادَةِ عَلَى الْإِبَادَةِ This is what he thought. And the ayah he mentioned, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةِ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ And fight them until there is no more fitna. Shirk. The word fitna here refers to shirk. This was mentioned by many of the Sahaba like Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abdullah Ibn Umar and others. There are some Orientalists who say that the word fitna does not refer to shirk. And also some Muslims. 
and I will, inshallah, um, dismantle and refute the Orientalists for their tampering of this. So when we ask them that why were they permitted to fight, they say that the Prophet was permitted to fight because the people of Makkah took his belongings. That was the reason of why he was commanded by Allah and permitted by Allah to fight because the people of Makkah took his belongings. The fitna was his belongings. فَإِنْ إِنْتَهُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ وَسِيلٌ And he says, and if they stop, then فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ وَسِيلٌ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything that they do. And the, indeed Allah the Most High sent him as a messenger at 40 years of age. Now, Shaykh al-Islam here will give us a brief biography of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that indeed Allah the Most High sent him, which is known as al bitha What do they call this? al bitha At 40 years of age. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was given, when he was sent as a messenger at 40 years of age, Years of age, Allah Arba'in a sana when Nubuwa was granted to him. So he called the people to Al Ikhlas. So he called the people to Ikhlas. So the Prophet was bestowed Nubuwa at the age of 40. And he called the people to Ikhlas and he told them to abandon worshipping everything other than Allah for 10 years. And abandoning what is besides Allah for a period of 13 years. So the Prophet Sallallahu he was given prophethood at the age of 40. And he was commanded by Allah to call to ikhlas. Wahdahu la sharika la. And watarku to abandon everything that was worshipped other than Allah for a period of 13 years. For a period of 13 years. Now, mean mean actually seen it. It's 10 years. How many years is it? 10. So that which is correct is not 13. Your English translations say 13, but it should be 10. Why? Because the incident of Al Isra wal Mi'raj happened three years before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made Hijrah to Medina in the 10th year of Al Bi'tha. So this is correct, 10 years. So what the Sheikh is saying that for the first 10 years of prophethood, there was only a tawhid. And very little commandments were revealed. Very few. Then in the 10th year of Hijrah, from 10 to 13, so Sheikh al-Islam has broken down the period of al bitha which is 30 years. He said for the first 10 years, the, the focus was only on Tawheed. And then the Salah came in the 10th year of al bitha And this is what he said. Thumma urija bihi ila sama. So this 13 is incorrect. The translation is incorrect because Al-Isra wal Mi'raj did not happen the year the Prophet ﷺ migrated to al Madin. It did not happen when he migrated to al Madina when he made Hijrah to al Madina. When did it happen? It happened in the 10th year of al Bi'tha. Yes? So make your correction. This shows Naam. Naam. So this is Tashif. You need to correct this. How do we determine that what is right and what is wrong? How do we determine that 13 is wrong and 10 is right? First of all, the, the manuscript. If you look at the manuscript, script, it says Asha. Secondly, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is trying to make a point here. What is his point? The importance of Tawheed. And only talking about Tawheed. He said this, without any dispute, happened only for 10 years. Then after 10 years, when the people became... So the people were nurtured upon Tawheed and won against shirk for one whole decade. For one whole decade. And then after a decade, the Prophet ﷺ, he went to Isra and Mi'raj, the night journey. And then Salah was ordained. 
So this is what Shekhar. So therefore 13 years does not stand. If when we look at the context, 13 years does not stand. So what he's trying to say is that even from 10 to 13, still there was Tawheed. For the first decade, there was only Tawheed. And then from 10 to 13, when Salah was ordained, Salah became the implementation of your Tawheed. By action. How? What do we read in, when we start our prayer? What's the first thing that we read? Huh? Fatiha. And what's the ayah? <coughs> and then he said, then he was taken up to the heavens and the five daily prayers were made obligatory upon him without any intermediary between him and Allah the Most High in that. Meaning, that the Prophet ﷺ spoke with Allah without any barrier. Again, this is a refutation of those who don't believe that Allah speaks. Hmm? This is a refutation of those who believe that Allah does not speak. And then he said, <coughs> then he commanded him after that with the hijrah. See, all this, when we look at all this Ismail, we know that 13 years is wrong. It has to be 10 years. Then Allah was commanded the Prophet to make hijrah migration. So he migrated to al Madinah and was ordered with jihad. So jihad became obligatory after Tawheed was established in Madinah. After the Khilafah was established in Madinah. After rulership was established in Madinah. And before that there was no jihad. So he strove in jihad for the sake of Allah, a true strike. For nearly 10 years. So the Medina, Medinan period is 10 years. Until the people entered into the deen of Allah in droves, in multitude numbers. يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ So when he had completed 63 years, when the Prophet ﷺ completed 63 years, Alhamdulillah, the deen was complete. The deen was perfected and the favor was completed and the trust and message from Allah was conveyed. Then Allah Most High took him by death. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this, no? So I said, when the Prophet Sallallahu completed 63 years and when the deen was perfected. So it took 23 years for the deen to be perfected. Out of those 23 years, the first 10 years, Mainly was on Tawheed. And the favor was completed. And the trust and the responsibility that the Prophet ﷺ was given by Allah to convey to the people was conveyed. Allah the Most High took the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ died. And by this, Alhamdulillah, the Shaykh here gave a brief illustration of the seerah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Beautifully done. What he did was that he gave you the most important component of the biography of the process. And in the beginning, he gave you the lineage briefly. And then he told you when he became a prophet, what he did when he done as a prophet, uh, prophet when his life was divided between the Makkah and the Medinian period, before Hijrah and after Hijrah, al and ba'da al-Hijrah. And by this, he completed the biography of the Prophet. He said that the Prophet was not taken by Allah until the deen was complete. This shows that the deen is complete. There is no need for any amendments or additions to it. So then he said, and the first of the messengers was Nuh and the last of them was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Just as he, Allah said, Inna awhayna ilayka kama awhayna ila Nuhi wa nabiyyina mimma. Verily we have they use the word inspired, but inspired should not be used. Verily, we have sent a revelation to you, O Muhammad, just as we sent a revelation to Nuh and the prophets after him. So this is evidence that Nuh was the first message. And the Most High, Umar Muhammadun illa Rasul. The Prophet ﷺ is but a Rasul, which means here, the Prophet ﷺ will die. What does this ayah mean? Wama Muhammadun illa Rasul. It means that the Prophet ﷺ is human and he will die. Bash. 
and the evidence that the Prophet is the last of the Prophets. Makana Muhammadun Aba Ahadi Mir Rijalikum, Walakin Rasulullah wa Khatam and Nabi, Makana Allah be Kulishin Alima. Muhammad is not the father of any man amongst you, but he is the messenger of Allah and the last of the prophets. And Allah is ever all aware of everything. So he mentioned Nuh is the first messenger and Rasulullah is the last messenger and prophet. Prophet is human. He, will, he died just as everybody else died. And the Prophet is the last of the prophets. And by this, Alhamdulillah, before the month of Ramadan, with the mercy of Allah, we have completed Al-Usul Al-Thalatha. And for those who... Uh, attack us and say that we don't complete books. Alhamdulillah, we have completed Al Usul of Salah. Barakallahu alaykum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.